So we are very fortunate to have the kickoff seminar for this semester with Professor Melin Tambe as a distinguished speaker. Uh, Professor Tambe is Gordon K. McKay Professor of Computer Science and Director of Center for Research in Computation and Society at Harvard University. He is also the Director of AI for Social Good at Google Research India. Professor Tambe is a recipient of the Ichikai John McCarthy Award, SCMC AI Autonomous Agents Research Award from AAMAS, Triple AI Robert S. Engelmore Memorial Lecture Award, Informs Wagner Prize, Reese Prize of the Military Operations Research Society, and Columbus Fellowship Foundation Homeland Security Award. And you have seen his bios, uh, illustrious bios, a lot of different awards that he has got, gotten. And he has also uh, received the meritorious commendations from agencies such as the US Coast Guard and the Los Angeles Airport. Professor Tambe is a fellow of Triple AI, American Association for the Artificial Intelligence, and SCM, Association for Computing Machinery. So without much ado, let us uh, give a big hands to Professor Tambe. I know that we are not meeting him in person, but he is very engaged and you'll see from his talk. So let's give a warm welcome to Professor Tambe. Thank so you. Milind, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, a really very kind introduction, Sajal. And uh, I was there uh, as Sajal, you and I were talking earlier a few years ago. And so right. I remember that visit very well. And thank you for the warm hospitality then and also now. So. I plan to speak for about uh, you know, 45, 50 minutes and then open it up for questions. Uh, of course, if there are you know, questions along the way, please uh, feel uh, free to ask them. I may not be able to see your uh, hand raised, so uh, you may have to actually <laughs> interrupt me. All right. So my work uh, you know, for the past 15 years or so has been focused on using AI and multi-agent systems for social impact. We focused on three areas, public health, conservation, and public safety and security. In all of these areas, the key challenge we focus on is how to optimize our limited intervention resources. So in terms of public health, we have large population to serve, but limited number of public health resources or social workers. Concrete example is work we have done with youth experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles. Harnessing the social networks of these youth, we are able to show that our influence maximization AI algorithms are far more effective in spreading HIV information and reducing HIV risk behaviors compared to traditional approaches that are used by these homeless drop-in centers. The technical areas I'll focus on here are social network algorithms and bandit algorithms. With respect to conservation, we have large conservation areas to protect, but limited number of ranger resources. Concrete example is work we've done in Uganda and Cambodia. Harnessing past poaching data, we are able to predict where poachers set traps or snares. And for the past several years, have been <clears throat> able to remove a large number of these snares, hundreds or even thousands. The technical area I'll focus on here are green security games, which combine machine learning and game theory. With respect to public safety and security, we've contributed a new model called Stackelberg Security Games and contributed new algorithms that have been in use by security agencies such as the US Federal Air Marshal Service, uh, the US Coast Guard and others. Today, I'll focus on just the public health and conservation uh, topics, which are also the focus of our work at Google Research Bangalore, focusing, um, and here are some nonprofits that we've worked on in Bangalore, Given the limited time, I'll only focus on one of the projects that we have ongoing in uh, Bangalore. As you look across all of these projects, there's three common themes. First, the use of multi-agent systems research, which is my area of work, social networks, game theory, and others. Second, embracing this uh, data to deployment pipeline. By that, um, that I mean, our first step is always to immerse ourselves in the domain, trying to understand the problems that are faced by these nonprofits, trying to understand what kind of data are available. Following <clears> that, <throat> predictive models makes predictions on give off the data available, which cases are high risk versus which cases are low risk. Now we cannot intervene on all of the high risk cases given limited resources. So our multi-agent reasoning intervention algorithms 
prescribe, recommend for us which cases to actually intervene on. Following that, field testing and deployment comes in not only because we want to understand the limitations of our models and algorithms, but because social impact is a key objective of our work. It's a first class citizen of, of this area of work. And so if we don't achieve AI for social impact, then we can't quite call ourselves engaged in AI for social impact work. Another theme you'll see, another aspect of this work is lack of data is often a norm. So we are supposed to be in this era of big data, swimming in big data, but often in these domains where we're working with marginalized or endangered communities, we face a lack of data. And this you will see is a repeated theme where we are trying to struggle with handling limitations of the data available. Finally, all of the work is only possible because of the interdisciplinary partnerships with nonprofits around the world, whether they're homeless drop-in centers in Los Angeles or wildlife conservation organizations around the world or other public health or conservation uh, nonprofits in India. The work we do is in service of empowering these nonprofits to use AI tools. Uh, they are engaged in such inspiring work and we want to avoid being gatekeepers to this AI technology for social impact. So in the rest of the presentation, I'll start by providing you, um, you know, some information on the work we are doing in public health, then in conservation. I'll cover papers from the last three to four years in conferences uh, such as our master Pelea and so forth. And to, I'll highlight the role of the lead PhD student or postdoc by putting up their pictures in the top right hand corners of the slides on which their work is shown. So you know who led the work. So let's start with the public health. Here I'll use for motivation this challenge of HIV prevention amongst youth experiencing homelessness. The rates of HIV in this population are 10 times the rates of the normal house population. In fact, there's 6,000 youth who sleep on the streets of Los Angeles every night, which is what which is where we have focused this work in. Now, we cannot communicate uh, HIV risk prevention message to all 6,000 youth individually. Therefore, homeless shelters or drop-in centers adopt this peer-led intervention strategy. They'll call in the peer leaders, educate them about HIV prevention and expect the peer leaders to talk to their friends and their friends to talk to their friends. And in this way, information to spread in the social network. This is face-to-face -face interaction. This is not happening over Facebook, et cetera. So this problem is essentially this problem of influence maximization in social networks that many of you may be familiar with in computer science. Given a social network graph, G, we are trying to choose K peer leader nodes such that we maximize the expected number of influence nodes. Now, information is supposed to spread in this independent cascade model, meaning we give information about HIV prevention to youth A, A will talk to their friend B, B will talk to their friend C, and information will cascade in this network. As we apply these standard influence maximization algorithms to our domains, however, there are several challenges. I'll focus on three. First, there's uncertainty in propagation probability over edges. Second, we can't have a, we can't have a situation where we bring in all peer leaders all at once. We have capacity limits. And so we call in a few of these peer leaders, but given the unfortunate circumstances these peer leaders are in, some of them may not be able to attend, which means that next time we call the next batch, we have to take into account who showed up in the first batch. So we have a requirement for a multi-step dynamic policy to handle no-shows. And third, the social network itself is not known. All we can do is have a limited querying budget. So we query a few of these peer leaders, uh, few of the people in the network to sample the network. Now, I'm going to address all of these challenges starting from the top. Initially, we'll assume the social network is known and then work our way downwards towards a situation when the social network itself is not known. So let's start with this uncertainty in propagation probabilities. Normally, 
if we assume that when we talk to a youth C about HIV prevention, their neighbor, their friend D will get to know about HIV prevention with a known probability, let's say 0.4. In our domain, immersion in the domain showed us that it is very difficult to get hold of these probabilities. Instead, we can model this as being sampled from some distribution. Now, we may not know the mean of this distribution, so we can say that this mean lies within some interval. So now we have this challenge of robust influence maximization of trying to spread influence when there's uncertainty in information propagation probability. We solve this problem by casting it as a game where our algorithm is trying to choose peer leaders and nature is trying to set parameter settings to cause our algorithm to perform as worse as possible. So we are trying to maximize spread of influence and nature is trying to minimize where the payoff is determined by the ratio of the outcome of our particular policy, our particular choice of peer leaders compared to the optimal choice had we known those parameters ahead of time. Now, some, there are some details here about mixed strategies and pure strategies in the game. They are available in the paper, but I'm going to describe to you the key intuition about how to solve this game. Now, along the rows here are the policies that the influencer is trying to choose. We are trying to choose something like, let's say 20 peer leaders or 30 peer leaders in a network of 40, uh, 400 youth. So we have 400 choose 30 choices along the rows for our policies. Nature is playing along the columns and is choosing parameters from a continuous setting. So you can imagine that there is a vast number of rows of strategies for the influencer. And of course, nature is choosing from a continuous interval. So there's a very large uh, set of strategies available for nature as well. So this is a very large scale game. We cannot represent it in memory, let alone trying to solve it. So these problems are solved using this double Oracle approach. So we start by initializing the game with a small number of strategies on both sides, maybe two or three each. And then uh, influencers Oracle will provide the next best policy to add. So we solve the game and the influencers Oracle says, this is the next best policy to add. And nature's Oracle will give a best response and say, this is the next best set of parameters to add to the game. And the game will grow and we iterate in this fashion until convergence and show that we can converge with approximation guarantees, even though we iterate only a small number of times. So this allows us to solve this game, giving us a robust strategy without actually representing the full game, only representing a very small fraction of the game. The second problem I mentioned is that, you know, we may want these 40 youth to be acting as, a peer, as peer leaders but we cannot bring them all in because our homeless shelter has a limited capacity. So we may only be able to invite, let's say four of them to come at a time. Now, one of them may not have bus fare and may ask their friend to attend. Another one may be forced to run away from the city. So we may have called a certain set of four youth, but not those four youth don't show up. What happens is three of them may have shown up. So the next time we choose the next four, which are shown in green, we have to take into account who showed up in the first time step. Now, the state of the network itself is unfortunately not available to us at this time. So this is a problem of planning under action and observation uncertainty, which is essentially solvable using POMDPs, partially observable markup decision problems. So these are going to recommend to us which youth to invite and based on who showed up, tell us which next four youth to invite. Now, solving these palm DPs on a large scale network is also very difficult. But one key idea is to understand that there are sub communities of these youth, youth who play on basketball together, youth who play on Venice Beach together. And so we can divide up the problem into smaller partitions of these palm DPs and in this way are able to solve this problem in a tractable fashion. The third challenge is we don't have a full social network. Now you can imagine sending our social work colleagues into the homeless shelter, asking everybody, who are your friends and so forth. And then 
tediously collecting data on the entire social network. But this is extremely costly and not scalable. Could we sample a small fraction, 15% of the networks, 15% of the youth, and obtain the information we need? So essentially, the problem is, given the total number of nodes, that is, let's say, 400 youth, we have a query budget. Let's say we can query only 40 of these youth. Can we, after querying 40 youth to sample the network, output the set of peer leaders we want to choose to spread influence such that the performance of the choice we have made is similar to what we have what would have obtained had we known the exact full network. So purely from so how to solve this problem, uh, we have a sampling algorithm. Essentially, it samples nodes randomly and estimates the sizes of the community that the nodes belongs to, and then chooses series from the largest K communities. We have some guarantees on the performance of this algorithm. Uh, this is a, uh, you know, Brian Wilder who led the paper uh, in AAA 2018. There's a lot of analysis. Uh, if you're interested, I highly encourage you to look at this work. So at this point, I have mentioned to you how we solved each of these challenges. Network sampling, there's a robust policy and multi-step policy. Put, putting it all together, we have this system, I'll call it sampling healer. A sampling because we don't know the full network, we are sampling the network. And it is going to recommend to us which peer leaders to select. So it will select uh, four peer leaders uh, and then based on who showed up, choose the next set of peer leaders. I'm seeing that there are some questions that uh, may be getting uh, accumulated in the chat window. Uh, I'm going to take a break and then, uh, you know, after this section is over and then maybe take a look at those questions and try to answer some. So, uh, Sajal, you want to say something? No, 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 you can go ahead. Okay. So at this point, having built this system of sampling healer, we decided uh, now it was time to do a pilot test. So we recruited 230 youth, 60 under each condition. There are four conditions. First sampling healer, that is the network is only sampled, 60 youth under this condition. Healer, which is exactly like our sampling healer algorithm, except we cheat and give it the full network. Again, around 60 youth in that. Healer plus is a version of healer. Degree centrality is the traditional approach. This approach calls in the most popular youth, the one with the highest degrees in the network. And again, we try to recruit 50, uh, 60 youth in this condition. So there are four separate bins. And now in each situation, we recruit 12 peer leaders according to the recommendation of that particular algorithm. And this is a picture from an actual information session where our social work colleagues are educating uh, these homeless youth about HIV prevention. This is a day long education session at the end of which the peer leaders are supposed to talk to their friends and then their friends will talk to their friends and so forth. So question is how many of the non peer leaders, the people we did not bring in got educated about HIV? And here's what we find. With degree centrality, which is the traditional approach, 25% of the non-peer leaders got educated about HIV. With Healer, which knew the full network, 75% of the non-peer leaders got informed. So clearly these influence maximization algorithms are far more effective in spreading HIV information compared to this traditional approach. But sampling Healer, which only knew a fraction of the network, performs similarly to healer, which knew the full network. Now, it actually seems to be performing better, but uh, that's just uh, possibly a small variation due to the experimental condition. What ultimately the message to be taken away from here is that sampling healer seems to perform really well compared to the degree centrality approach and hence to, for the larger scale study, this was the approach we decided to carry forward. Now in the larger scale study, we recruited uh, 750 youth. This is work done jointly with Professor Eric Rice in social work. And this is, as far as we know, the first large scale application of influence maximization for public health. This was done in collaboration with three homeless shelters in Los Angeles, My Friend's Place, Los Angeles LGBT Center and Safe Place for Youth. There were 250 youth recruited in each of the three conditions. First, sampling healer, second, degree centrality, the more traditional approach, and third, no intervention at all. And so 
here we are not only interested in who got informed, but whether there was actually any change in behavior. So we recruited the peer leaders for each condition based on the recommendations of the relevant algorithm. Then we checked what happened after one month. Then we checked what happened after three months. And here's what we find. So at the end of one month, in terms of reduction in condomless anal sex, what you will see here is that sampling healer leads to 35%, uh, close to 35% reduction, but with degree centrality and control this HIV risk behavior, there is no change at all at the end of one month. At the end of three months, degree centrality begins to catch up, but it's still not as good as our sampling healer approach. Now, the fact that sampling healer got changes in behavior faster is very important because this is a risk behavior. And also because it's a community where people come and go. It's a place where people are not just statically placed, which means that send, having this information out there faster is important. Similarly, in other metrics like a reduction in condomless vaginal sex, you will again see that sampling healer performs better. So this clearly has pleased our collaborators and this is what they have to say. Beautiful way to kind of like marry this, this tech world with this social service world, like and how we can, we can kind of go deeper and impact young people and elevate them. If this group became a, a really big thing, it could really help out a lot of, of youth. And so this is now continuing on uh, in terms of research. We are looking at other approaches such as using reinforcement learning. Uh, this has shown some improvement over our earlier approaches, but it's very exciting to see what else is possible and to test this out in the real world. Simultaneously, we have been talking to these uh, shelters to adopt these policies as a way of continuing their work on a regular basis. So it's very exciting in terms of both research and continuing this uh, deployment in practice. This HIV prevention is not the only application in terms of public health for social networks. Another one is suicide prevention. Here, one way this can be done is by gatekeeper selection. Gatekeepers are community members who will keep an eye out on their peers to try to alert counselors if the peers say something that, that may uh, lead such a referral to be made. So for example, if somebody in the community says, you know, sometimes I want to sleep and never get up. Then one of the gatekeepers may be able to alert a counselor or refer the, the youth to a counselor. Now, we have a limited number of gatekeepers who we can select and train, and they have to cover the entire graph. So this seems like a graph covering problem. However, some of the gatekeepers may not be able to perform the task allocated to them. And therefore this becomes like a robust graph covering problem with gatekeepers to maximize worst case coverage of the graph, knowing that some of the gatekeepers are not going to be able to perform their task. So we chose some uh, recent algorithms from ro uh, robust graph covering and tried to apply it in this context. And what we found is there's disparity across uh, different racial groups. And so to avoid this kind of racial disparity and ensure fairness, We've looked at uh, approaches such as max min fairness, diversity constraints, which comes from cooperative game theory. And there are papers published at NeurIPS and Nichkai. But at our recent AAAI paper, what we point out is that it may be better for a human in the loop to make these decisions so that the system essentially offers different trade-offs that are possible in terms of fairness and performance. So at this time, I'm gonna switch and move on to the next set of applications, which is based on health program adherence. Here, I'm going to start uh, talking about work we are doing at Google Research India. And so the problem we have focused on here is maternal and child care. The situation in India with respect to maternal and child care is very dire. A woman dies in childbirth every 15 minutes in India, four out of 10 children are too thin or short. And we are very fortunate to be working with a nonprofit called Arman, which serves 18 million women and has 160,000 health workers who work for them. One of their programs is called M Mitra, a mobile friend. And so they give a call every week, automated voice call in the voice of a local health worker in the local language. It's a friendly three minute message about health, something like, 
you know, you are in the sixth week of pregnancy, enroll in a government, in this government program. Your child is three months old. Give them this health supplement. Arman has shown that women who enroll in this program, Emitra, in randomized control trials, they have shown the significant benefit that the women accrue in terms of their own health and health of the babies. 2.2 million women are enrolled in Emitra. Unfortunately, some fraction of these women, a large 30% up to uh, women may enroll and then become low listeners or drop out. Thus, they don't get the benefits of Emitra. The question for us is, can we predict who's going to drop out before they drop out so that Arman can intervene on them and stop them from leaving the program? So basic problem is how to predict which beneficiaries are likely to drop out to allow Arman to focus intervention. Here's what we get in terms of input. So here's mother number one, mom number one. Uh, the first week Arman gives an automated call. She does not pick up the phone. Week two, she picks up. Week three, she picks up. Week four, she picks up. Week five, she picks up. Mom number two listens to the voice call, uh, automated call in week one and week two, but not in week three. Yes, in week four, but not in week five. And so on and so on for hundreds or thousands, hundreds of thousands of these moms. Now, it turned out in this particular example that eventually mom number two and mom number four dropped out of the program. This is a loss to these moms, to the program. If we could tell Arman after the first five weeks itself, for example, that these two moms are at a high risk of drop off, then Arman could do a live call or go send health workers to their home to understand why they're not, uh, you know, why they are at high risk. And sometimes there are small adjustments as to the timing of the call or other small adjustments that allows these women to be retained in the program. So this is the system that we've built. We first did extensive tests with past data. Then we did this pilot where we got data from beneficiaries enrolled in November and December of 2019. And then I ran a test through January of April 2020 to check if our predictions were accurate. And what we find is that in terms of accuracy metrics like F1 recall, precision, et cetera, this system is quite accurate, more than 0.8 with respect to all of these measures. And so this is where the system is now deployed. We are doing these pilot tests where not only are these uh, women, we are flagging women who are at high risk of drop off, but then intervening on those women to retain them in the program. So this is, we're very excited by seeing that this has, you know, this could start helping the 300,000 beneficiaries who are enrolled in this program. A similar adherence problem also arises in tuberculosis prevention. Tuberculosis is a mass, you know, uh, has been a disease that has killed millions around the world. In India alone, it causes half a million deaths per year and 3 million are infected every year. In the time of COVID, uh, some of these numbers don't seem as big, but these are big numbers. And non, one big problem here is non-adherence to TB treatment. Patients are supposed to take their medicine for six months, but after a few weeks, they drop off of the program. And this is bad for them because they themselves don't get well and it leads to drug resistant bacteria. So it's bad for society. So to avoid this dropping off, there's digital adherence tracking. So essentially you can see this pill pack here that is shown. And so every time you open a pill, there's a randomized phone number that is shown. And so the patient is supposed to call the phone number to let the health worker know that I have taken my medicine today. And the phone number is randomized. So you can't know what it is before you open that particular pill. Now, health workers can see, oh, somebody has not called for a few days and then, then realize this person is dropping off from the program. Then again, you know, go to their home or try to get them to adhere. But that means that they've already missed a few doses and then you figure out that this person is dropping out. Could we predict in advance and intervene before patients miss the dose? And again, similar to the Arman, we can look at the phone call pattern and make predictions. And this is work done with a nonprofit called Everwell, where with data from 15,000 patients and 1.5 million phone calls, we're able to show that our predictions are more effective than their rule-based system in terms of improving the rate of true positives, reducing the rate of false positives. And we are going through IRB approvals and all of that to 
test this in practice. So, so far I've talked to you about making predictions as to who's at high risk. But the next thing is prescription, who to actually intervene on because we cannot intervene on all of the patients. And so imagine that you have a health worker who has, to, you know, who has say hundreds of patients under her care and she has to decide which patients to actually call because she cannot call all hundreds of patients in one day. So she may say, okay, among these high-risk patients, I'm going to call the first three. And then finds out that this is uh, related to this TB domain. She may say, she may find out that two of them took their medicine, but one of them did not. So now she encourages all of them to continue to take their medicine and she has to decide which three patients can I call tomorrow. So she may call the next three uh, and then figure out that one of them has not taken their medicine. And then based on that, decide who to call the next day and on and on and on for 180 days, which is the length of which the medicine has to be taken. So every day there's this choice being made as to who to call. Now, as I understand it today in Mumbai, for example, this work is done in a round robin fashion, call the first then, then the next then, then the next then, and so forth. Question for us is, can we do better? And the approach we have taken is this idea of restless bandage, adherence restless bandage. So this is a particular model uh, whereby we assume that uh, it has, uh, there are two states. The patient is either adhering, taking their medicine or not. And then we are trying to choose a policy to give to the health worker to try to make sure that she calls them uh, in the policy, in the way specified by the policy. And what this means is that sometimes, you know, somebody is always taking their medicine every time you call them. There is no point in keeping on calling them again and again. Whereas some patients have not taken their medicine, it is important to keep calling them to remind them to take their medicine. So this restless bandage allows us to come up with a policy that is more flexible rather than this round robin policy. And we have new algorithms to generate such policies. And we have shown that compared to previous work in restless bandage, which are shown here in orange, our algorithms are significantly faster and don't lose as much in solution quality. I'll go to the third area of work on COVID modeling. Uh, just briefly mention some of the work there and we can take a quick break to see the questions uh, that uh, people may have. So in, May, in March of uh, 2020, we started our work on agent-based modeling for COVID. And so we uh, had a detailed agent-based model in terms of families, comorbidities, age, and so forth. And use this model to make uh, predictions on what would happen if different states change their policies with respect to uh, lockdowns and so forth. And it made some news at the time. Following that, we've been looking at the COVID testing policy. Um, this is a paper that was published in Science Advances uh, last year. So essentially the range of tests entering the market of varying sensitivity and cost. And the question is, should we go for quantity or quality? So there's the PCR test, which is a gold standard test, which detects very low viral concentration, but costs higher and takes more time to, uh, to get back results. Whereas something like antigen strip, which is less sensitive, detects, requires higher viral concentration, but is cheaper and we can get results back quickly. And the question is, you know, if you are a big campus or if you're a, a small town, which, you know, and you want to test the population, should you use the gold standard test or the antigen strip? Now, uh, for some of these places, if they really test the whole population using this uh, uh, gold standard type test, then that would be a real problem in terms of their budget. So here's what we find in our agent-based model. On the y-axis is number of infections, lower is better. Blue is the more sensitive test. Orange is the less sensitive test. And so, if we could administer the test on the whole population at the same frequency and get back results instantaneously, then of course the more sensitive test works out better in terms of reducing infections. However, if there is a one day delay in getting back results of the more sensitive test, which is what is expected, then all of the benefit of this more sensitive test is lost. The number of infections rises because the way this is supposed to work is that the whole population is tested. Anybody found positive, we isolate. 
But if there's a day's delay in isolating these people, then all of the benefit of the more sensitive test is lost. Furthermore, due to cost, if we can only run the more sensitive test every five days instead of every three days, again, all of the benefit of the more sensitive test is lost. So in short, test sensitivity is secondary to turnaround time and frequency. We should choose a test that has quicker turnaround time and can be applied at high frequency, basically something like the antigen strip. This result was seen uh, to be used by the World Health uh, Organization. Uh, it was covered extensively in various news outlets, uh, New York Times, Washington Post, et cetera, and has allowed our epidemiology collaborators to advocate to FDA and CDC. And in fact, Michael Mina, who's our epidemiology collaborator at the Harvard uh, School for Public Health, is now advising the Biden COVID task force uh, in terms of this COVID testing policy. So at this point, I'm going to switch uh, topics to talk about conservation. But before I go there, I wanted to see if there are questions. So we'll take a five minute break for questions and then we can uh, go back to conservation. So I'm looking at the chat window. Um, and uh, yeah, does I think I can, yeah, I have, I have uh, kept track of the sequencing. So Ardendu, you can ask the question. I prefer the time there. So Melinda, I'm asking in the order that they pose the question. So to make fantastic, it and we'll we'll take like a five minute of questions and then move on, uh, just sure. so, so that we can please go on or then do. Yeah. So I I was curious about a uh, couple of things actually, but uh, let me. Uh, so when you say you sample the network, um, like do you give the uh, lesson to somebody and then check if their friends have information about it how is that done that's an excellent question so sampling the network basically we're just trying to get information about the network so we you know originally if you want to know information of the entire network the way it was done is that a social worker would sit in the homeless shelter check who's talking to whom they would give every person a, a questionnaire saying who are your top five friends and then based on all of that you know draw a full network of who's connected to whom but they had to survey every single person in the homeless shelter. If there were 100 people, you know, ask questions for 100 people, then sit and make sure that they are, you know, who's talking to whom, all of that. Instead, in the sampling, idea is that you just sample, meaning you ask, give a survey to, let's say, 20 people instead of 100 people. And you say, who are the top five people you talk to every day? And uh, based on that sample, which obviously is only a small sample of the network, then you decide who uh, to call for intervention. Does that clarify? So it is, yes. Yeah. So it is self-reported sampling as opposed to you checking whether they have actually uh, disseminated the information. So this is only before uh, information dissemination. This is only trying sure. to gather information on the network. Correct. Right. Uh, okay. So Milan, I think there are other like questions. So I'll, yeah. Yeah. Arjun, do you have another question? Oh, um, the other thing was about the Oracle, uh, the Oracle, I think it was more like a sort of a technical question, like you mentioned convergence in fewer rounds. So uh, I was just trying to think why that is possible. And so I kind of feel that it's when you decide when the influencer Oracle decides which policy to add. Uh, I, I do not know how it exactly happens in real life, but I assume it needs a lot of information to decide which is the next best. So the, the way it is done is that you solve the uh, original game yeah. and then the Oracle uh, just adds the best response to that mixed strategy in the original game. And so it's just the best response given, you know, every time each Oracle just says, this is my best response to the, you know, best opponent policy from the main game. And uh, it is, uh, you know, it is well known or empirically, you know, you can observe that you converge in a you know, relatively few number of cycles. So uh, it's not necessary. Uh, you may have to you know, explore a lot of policies, but in practice, it turns out that it just works really well in being able to converge. So convergence means no Oracle can add new policies because there is no, you know, they, they just don't have a better response. And so it is well known that uh, you empirically, you can often converge much faster and that's what we observe. Thank you. So Milan, would you like to take one more question or want to continue? 
Um, I think it's uh, maybe I'll just continue and then we'll just end. Uh, sure. Okay. Please. Then, uh, then we can continue this conversation. Thank you for these excellent questions. So the conservation part, I'll go through. Uh, it's a smaller part. I'll go through relatively quickly. So here uh, we are focused on hmm, uh, this problem of uh, protecting large uh, wildlife uh, conservation areas. So this is uh, Queen Elizabeth National Park in Uganda. So there's you know wonderful wildlife there, but there are threats to the wildlife, traps or snares in the thousands that get placed to maim and kill this beautiful wildlife. And rangers, as you can see in this picture, have to go around the park trying to find these snares. You can see it's not easy for them uh, to find these snares. So the question is, how can we help these rangers? Again, large conservation areas, very limited number of rangers. So one idea is to divide up the park into one kilometer by one kilometer grid square. And then uh, using this notion of Stackelberg security games, provide recommendations to, as to where to patrol to the rangers. So for those who may not be familiar, this is the way the game is played. Uh, again, this is just two by two game, but of course in reality, there's thousands and thousands of uh, square kilometers to play on. So we have the ranger, which is trying to choose which area to go to. And we have a poacher, which looks at where the ranger is going and then react. So for example, if the ranger says, I'm going to area one and always going to area one, then the poacher will put the trap in area two, getting a positive reward, the ranger gets a negative reward. So generally the result uh, to solve this game, we come up uh, with a defender strategy, meaning we provide a recommendation to the ranger to come up with a mixed strategy, a randomized strategy. Some 60% of the time go to area one, 40% of the time go to area two, so that it is difficult for the poacher to predict where to put the snare and to reduce the expected utility of the poacher. Now, traditional work in uh, Stackelberg security game has been focused on a very strategic adversary. Whereas what we face here are boundedly rational poachers. And so we can learn how the adversaries, these poachers are responding to our patrols based on past poaching data. And so we can predict if we patrol a certain area uh, with a certain frequency, what is the probability, how the, the poacher might react in terms of continuing to put snares there or in a neighboring area. So what we have is this problem of predicting where the poachers would put snares as a key problem before we get into solving the game. So we are trying to predict where the poachers are gonna set traps. We have 14 years of data from Uganda at the time we solved this game. It told, tells us the range of patrol frequency per square kilometer. We have data on distance of each grid square to nearest river, road, villages. Uh, area slope, I mean, there's a lot of data based on which now trying to make this prediction of probability of placing a snare. Uh, there's lots of very interesting challenges here because uh, there's uncertainty, all kinds of uncertainty. In the interest of time, I'm just gonna move forward. There's a, an ensemble model that was developed to solve this problem. Having done it, the next step then was to say, how does it actually perform in the field? Because our collaborators, in Uganda, we're not satisfied just by showing them some results in the lab. They wanted to see it perform well in practice. So we selected two nine square kilometer areas in Queen Elizabeth. They're shown in these green dots. The green dots don't overlap with the red dots. Red dots is where previously snares have been found. So now we are telling the port rangers to go to new areas. You haven't patrolled these areas, but we are confident you are going to find snares there because this is where our model is predicting there are snares that you haven't caught. So this was a pilot test that was done. Uh, this just happened one month before a conference deadline. So if the rangers found snares, then we would be able to write a paper. Otherwise, you know, no paper. And so uh, we sent this, you know, uh, the rangers were out patrolling this area for one month. And every day they would send back an email saying, today we found nothing, tomorrow, you know, we found nothing, et cetera. And then uh, they said, we found a poached elephant with its tusks cut off. So this was too sad in the sense that we were too late to save this elephant, but at least the machine learning model was telling us where to go. Then they found a whole elephant snare roll and removed it. So poachers were active in the area. They were killing elephants, but before they could kill the next set of elephants, a whole elephant snare roll was removed. And then 10 antelope snares were removed. So this gave us hope that this model is making good predictions in terms of where to send the rangers. 
Having completed the pilot test, the next test was to do a full scale test. So this was done in three national parks, uh, Queen Elizabeth and Murchison Falls in Uganda and Sri Park Wildlife Sanctuary in Cambodia. In each case, we selected 24 areas. In each case, we marked some of these areas as high risk and some as low risk, meaning our model predicted that all of, in all of these areas, which were lightly patrolled before or not patrolled before, some of these areas are high risk, we predict, some are low risk. And now we sent the rangers for six months to patrol these areas to check if our predictions are accurate. If, and, and it indeed turned out that where we predicted high risk, more snares were found, where we predicted low risk, less snares were found. So this is building up a lot of confidence that this is the right approach now to be using in national parks in order to save wildlife. In Cambodia, compared to 2018, there, there was a five-fold increase in the number of snare captures per month. So this is really beneficial for our, uh, you know, rangers who putting their who are putting their lives on the line, trying to protect wildlife around the globe. So so far, I've talked to you about predicting where there is a danger of seeing snares, but having given these predictions, rangers have to plan patrol coverage. So now having uh, gotten these predictions, the next step is to optimize patrol coverage. This can be done first do prediction, then separately do planning to patrol, uh, for patrol coverage. However, if you do this in two separate stages, this turns out to be suboptimal. It is better to take into account what it is that we are trying to do which is to plan patrol coverage during the prediction phase itself. So the loss function of the prediction stage is not just to achieve higher accuracy, but to actually maximize defenders expected utility to by planning better patrol coverage. And so this change in the uh, loss function, which is derived automatically by doing this end to end learning or what we've been calling decision focused learning allows us to actually in simulation lead to better results. So the blue line shows the expected utility if we adopt this kind of game-focused learning by changing the loss function to adopt to the actual task we are trying to achieve. Um, this is again exciting in terms of trying to test this idea out in the field. So something that we are looking at doing next. So having looked at the success of our pilot, uh, you know, of our predictions across the globe in Uganda and Cambodia. We've been collaborating with this organization called SMART and I'll come to uh, them a little bit later again to spread SMART over into hundreds of national parks around the globe. And whereas something like Sri Park Wildlife Sanctuary has you know, 45,000 patrol observations in the last five years, there's other parks like this Royal Belem Park in Malaysia, which has very few observations. So there are parks that are data rich where we can do all of this predictive model and game focused learning and all of that good stuff. But then there is the data poor park, data scarce parks where we have to figure out where to patrol actually to collect data. And so there's this exploration exploitation trade off there in terms of improving the predictive model. But if you just exp keep exploring to try to get more data then you'll start losing wildlife. And so there's this exploration exploitation trade off that needs to be accomplished. And to that end, uh, we have this newer model called Lizard, which is a bandit algorithm, uh, which is a paper that was published in AAAI 2021, which basically takes the end targets in the park as input, given a time horizon, uh, tells us which targets to patrol based on what gets found. In the interest of time, I'm going to uh, move ahead. I'm going to talk a little bit about this work on spot and then uh, uh, you know, end by opening up for questions. So SPOT is this uh, idea that Air Sh worked with a nonprofit called Air Shepherd, which flies drones in Kruger National Park and other parts of the world. And so they take videos or have taken videos, um, infrared videos, and they beam those videos, send those videos to a van at night to try to see if there are poachers in the park. You can see some of the still images from those videos. And you're trying to figure out, a human being is trying to look at those and try to see, if, is there a poacher from this video? Because you can see the 
video is taken from a drone infrared late at night and it's uh, you know from some high angle up there it's very difficult for a human being so spot tries to automatically detect poachers and animals from these videos to simplify the goal for the uh, human being to notice poachers and if so then they can alert rangers to come in and stop uh, these poachers so there's more that uh, I, I can cover, but I'm going to skip over some of the signaling work uh, in the interest of time and tell you that pause is now going global. The pause system is the one that predicts where poachers are setting traps or snares. We've been collaborating with this organization called SMART, which is a collaboration of 13 different uh, conservation organizations such as WWF, WCS and others. And Pause is now available globally to hundreds of national parks to download and to use it to make predictions about where poachers are setting traps and try to remove them. And this is work where there's now field testing going on beyond just what we did in Uganda and Cambodia and parks around the world. It's really very exciting in terms of all that is getting accomplished. And we hope that this system will now ultimately help us save wildlife and assist rangers who are putting uh, their lives on the line to save wildlife around the globe. And hopefully this can then be extended towards protecting forests, fisheries, and others. So I'll end here by drawing some key lessons that we have learned in our work. First, achieving social impact and AI innovation go hand in hand. It's not, it's not the case that in trying to achieve social impact with our work that we have to give up on AI research. In fact, yeah, yeah, achieving the social impact needs to leads to newer kind of AI research uh, innovations. Secondly, we have to take a whole data to deployment pipeline. We have to embrace the whole pipeline. This work is not just about improving algorithms. Uh, we actually have to show results on the ground to show improvement, which means that there have to be new ways of evaluating this work, not just by seeing if there was an improvement in the algorithm, because maybe you improve this algorithm, but it had no impact in terms of what it accomplished. It's important to step out of the lab and into the field. Again and again, we see that going into the field and observing what is going on firsthand allows us to draw new insights into our models and algorithms. Of course, uh, AI is not you know, by itself going to solve these problems. We need to embrace interdisciplinary work, whether with social work colleagues or conservation scientists and others. Lack of data is a norm. The social network was not available to us. Um, you know, who's taking their medicine and who's not is not available to us. So that's why we need these bandit algorithms. In, in the national parks, some of the parks have very little data. So all of this we have to embrace as part of our project strategy. We cannot just complain that, oh, there's, you know, there's not good data, so I'm going to not do this project. And finally, our ultimate goal really is to empower these nonprofits to use our AI tools and avoid being gatekeepers to this AI technology for social impact. So I'm going to stop here. Um, there are, you know, I wanted to acknowledge collaboration from wonderful colleagues uh, from many different organizations. And I'm open to collaborating with the members of the audience uh, who want to focus on AI for social impact. Um, there's my Twitter handle as well, in case you wanted to follow up on some of our recent work. And uh, again, I L I'll end here by thanking Sajal for uh, inviting me and uh, really appreciate uh, this opportunity. And now we can uh, take some questions. Thank you. Sure. But before that, uh, Melin, uh, thank you very much for a very exciting talk, which is not only grounded in uh, basic science, applied science also as a social impact right, uh, which impacts all of us uh, in daily life. So let us all first thank Professor Millen. Thank you. Uh, so I'll be uh, asking uh, people in order of the questions that I see on the chat, and then after that, it will be open to the floor, okay? So Perry, are you still there? Uh, yes, I am. Yeah, please do ask your question. Okay, so I was kind of curious um, when we were talking about um, the HIV, um, um, uh, you know, social network tracking. Um, were you using like, it kind of reminded me of Erdos's random graphs. Uh, were you using something like Erdos's random graphs and then uh, using the information you were collecting from the, uh, the, the shelters to kind of inform the probabilities around that? Or is that, is that kind of what you were doing? So the, 
what's happening there is first we are only looking at uh, the uh, graph structure we are not using any demographic data you know okay. race gender nothing so we are just collecting graph data and then based on the structure of the graph the influence maximization algorithm strategically selects which youth to bring in for <clears throat> you know offering them uh, education about hiv so the previous approach which was bring in the most popular youth that is bring in the all the nodes that have the highest degree they end up concentrating all of the information and education on the center of the graph so all of these people know each other they are very high degree they spread messages amongst each other which means that a lot of the sub communities in the network as we discussed you know the graph has many sub communities they don't get as much information whereas our uh, you know influence maximization algorithms are strategic they'll they'll pick different parts of the network from where to pull the peer leaders and have them spread information and that is why it is more effective in spreading information does that kind of answer your question um a bit yeah 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 i was i was i was curious well i guess ultimately the, the i, I kind of pull back every single one of your your projects had me wondering you know if if you did any kind of comparison um against you know just kind of randomly selected uh, populations to determine if you know the model was significantly better than just randomly selected populations but um yeah so so when you say randomly selected you mean randomly selected peer leaders or something yeah, like that yeah randomly selected peer leaders maybe random selected locations within the parks you know i mean because i think a similar question i had a similar question with uh you know pause and that kind of stuff no so so no, that that's that's really very very important so certainly we have done lots of uh, simulations uh, you know for example let's take the social networks work uh, we've certainly done lots of work where you um you know ra randomly select peer leaders instead of being strategic about it now in the real world when we want to do this large scale study um we have to be a little bit careful because this is uh, you know so we have to uh, compare it with uh, what is currently employed in practice because mm -hmm. that's what they do and we want to show them that we beat their current approach mm -hmm. so that once they see that their approach is beaten then they can be persuaded as to adopting our approach so, <laughs> right. so that's that's what uh, was done um with you know and and that's a very very interesting question uh, with respect to you know trying to show uh, against random strategies there are other domains where we have done done that but uh, I'll, i'll come back to this question a little later based on the time available thank you thank okay. you excellent right. question thanks, Th thanks peri uh, seed you are next Sid, are you there? He's muted. Sid? Uh, yes, sorry, I was muted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just started talking without even realizing I was muted. Sure. Um, go ahead. Thank you, Professor Thambi, for the talk. It was very nice. Uh, I, I was curious. I mean, most of your work involved interacting with people, and there is only one place where you mentioned um, using bounded rationality models, especially when it comes down to poachers. um i was wondering what specific models better describe uh poachers behaviors and have you looked at uh using bounded rationality to uh even model you know pregnant women behavior when they were hand handling calls so on so forth excellent excellent uh so in the network models uh, for example you know we have used a very standard uh, approach in terms of uh, nodes reception and transmission of the messages it's uh, it would be very interesting to extend it to use some other kinds of uh, you know somehow to integrate uh, reasoning about bounded rationality there so in other words where you don't see bounded rationality being integrated it's a research opportunity it's not a, it's not it's just that we haven't gotten there yet with respect to the national parks the history is something like this uh, we did initial work using a uh, quantal response type models uh, and so that was our first go to so this was done before we actually got data from the park so we would do human subject studies in the lab and then we came up with our own uh, model there's a rich history of uh, papers there's one in the ai journal called sharp which combines the quantal response with all sorts of um additional uh, modeling assumptions about uh, what we have seen with human subjects in the lab so we were very pleased with these uh, sets of models but then we started getting real data from real parks and we suddenly started realizing whereas in the lab we have 
you know, tons of data available with human subjects in terms of what choices they made, uh, where they failed, where they succeeded. Uh, you know, you can track one single individual from one trial to the next to the next. In the national parks, you have this very limited data. You don't know which poacher, uh, you know, put snares where. All you have is location of snares. And so from that to apply these more complicated models, which depended on knowing how a single poacher behaved over time and so forth became very difficult. And over time, we realized that the models that, uh, the other thing was that these um, organizations also have severe uh, resource limits. So you can't tell them, you know, run this very complicated, uh, uh, you know, uh, Markov model, uh, hidden Markov model or something, because the computational resources really are truly limited. And so therefore you have to come up with a model that is fast and yet can work with this very limited amount of data. So what has worked well is actually, you know, ensembles of decision trees. We've, we've shown that even, you know, Gaussian processes, GPs work better uh, ensembles, but they just, you know, computational resource limits means even those are not workable. And so we end up in the actual system that is actually being used it's an ensemble of decision trees because that's all they can afford to pay for. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, I myself am working on uh, a similar problem. Uh, I've taken content moderation as an application. So content moderators go through uh, um, a lot of mental deterioration as they work through uh, ex extreme sensitive data. And we try to model uh, their decisions using discounted satisficing, uh, and we model them as bandits, and we try to learn, predict uh, when they would stop working. Because content moderation industry has a lot of worker sustenance issues, and, and we are trying to do that as, as of now, as we speak, and uh, the paper will probably roll out very soon. And, and I was excited when you were talking about similar problems in other applications as well. Um, no, that's, you know, yeah. uh, one final question. Do you think the data is available out, uh, online openly, the work for all the works that you're doing? So first of all, thank you for the great work that you yourself are doing. I would love to follow up on the paper that you mentioned. Some of the data are and some are not. Uh, the poaching data, if you are a national park uh, and you want the data, or if you are a researcher, uh, you know, who they trust, uh, these organizations would be willing to share data like WWF, WCS, et cetera. The worry is not to make it completely open source because poachers may download the data. And so they don't want that. But uh, yeah, I mean, if you are a researcher, uh, you can negotiate with them and you know, get agreements. Uh, there are other researchers who, are, you know, who have access to this data and so forth and study and their papers published and so on in you know, uh, different conservation journals. Uh, same with the social network um, data. Uh, some of you know the social work organizations or our colleagues would be willing to share. There is no secrecy there. There is just uh, uh, maybe some privacy issues or something that they may be guarding against, and that should be released in the public domain. So you know, where possible, the data certainly all the code, all the algorithms, all of that is public domain. Uh, so that is all you know. You're free to download like the agent model for COVID that I mentioned, it's, you know, freely available, easily downloadable, workable, et cetera. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good. Uh, Melin, there are a couple of other questions that I see on the chat. So Sainath, you are next. Uh, hello, Professor Pambe. Uh, so I've actually had very similar questions to uh, uh, so like uh, Dr. said. So I guess you have already answered my question. So I'll be good. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you. So Manoj, you are next then. Yeah, sometimes you may get the questions answered already. So there's no need to re <laughs> ask again. Uh, thank you, Dr. Das. Uh, Professor Melin, uh, this was a very insightful talk. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, my question is, like you already mentioned about the limited amount of data and like i see those these are the like non traditional applications of ai and machine learning so uh, with this limited and unstructured data how are you uh, approaching this like in terms of algorithms and methods and like how is that like uh, how is the, the difference translating in real world 
Excellent question. I think one of the key things that's happening here is that, you know, uh, when uh, we started working on these domains, AI for social impact, whether in conservation, public health, public safety, and others, uh, around, you know, everybody would keep talking about, hey, there's so much big data and, you know, we should be, you know, the big data is very fashionable and all of that. I would fly into airports even like uh, and see big, big uh, advertisements for big data. And we were always struggling with limited amounts of data. And I used to always wonder what is going on here. But it is truly the case that if you're working with uh, these communities, you know, these uh, marginalized communities, uh, you know, endangered communities, endangered wildlife, all of this, and organizations that are really not equipped uh, to collect all of this data, then you have to just work with this limited amount of data available. Uh, one of my colleagues who works in uh, suicide, you know, he works with suicide prevention, he gave us like the best, he said, this is the best data set available in the US on suicide prevention uh, among you know, all of the social work colleagues and so forth. And one of my students looked at it, uh, who was working with me at the time, and he said, well, I can't work with this data, it's so messy. And you know, the field's missing and people don't answer questions and all of that. And uh, you know, whereas uh, our colleagues are telling us, look, this is the data. So then the basic point is that the research question is in the data itself and really to try to figure out what to do with this uh, limited amount of data. So I would say that a lot of our research is <clears throat> focused on, you know, what to do with this limited amount of data and what kind of strategies do we adopt? Uh, so network sampling or the bandit algorithms or other kinds of, um, you know, techniques that compensate for the limited amount of data. Uh, those have to be like our, uh, you know, th those, end up being sort of major, major uh, uh, challenges to deal with in research. And on the other, and, and also, as I mentioned, uh, you know, these organizations are un, unable to invest in vast amounts of computational resources. They don't have that kind of money. And so that means that we have to also come up with lightweight solutions. So it's, it opens up a very interesting and new uh, kind of uh, uh, research problems. I mean, it's not, Perhaps uh, you know it may be a little bit too um, cache or too too um, uh, too sort of um, uh, blunt to say this, but basically you know there's sort of AI for the rich where there is a lot of data, and then there's the AI for the rest uh, where uh, we are sort of working with limited data, uh, limited computing resources, and uh, trying to trying to in continue to innovate in that area. Oh, yeah. yeah, thank you. So Melin, uh, I hope you have some time to take a couple of other questions. Please. Good, good. So this is a question from a colleague in material science and engineering. He also applies um, AI for material science and other things. And his uh, audio is not working. So I'm asking on his behalf, Dr. Aditya Kumar. So in the national park context, the poachers may become more strategic and change their tactics. How do models account for such changes? So there's two uh, answers here. The first is the obvious changes that the poachers might do, which is that if you say, you know, we point, uh, we point out to the ranger, these are the hotspots and the rangers only go to the hotspots, then the poachers are going to shift to neighboring areas. And um, <clears throat> this is where the game theory part comes in, which will say, uh, anticipate where the poachers are going to go. So for example, um, they'll say, well, if we put more pressure on location A, poachers are going to shift to location B. And so they will, a game theoretic algorithm will try to randomize over A and B so that it has anticipated the poachers next move. So that is the more obvious answer. But some, what we have also observed like in uh, Cambodia, when, we, when the poachers realize that uh, a large number of their traps, many more, are being confiscated and removed. They actually, uh, you know, came in a larger force with guns and attacked the rangers. One just uh, before we went uh, to Cambodia, actually, we the uh, rangers had gotten into a firefight, and one of the rangers was hospitalized as a result of uh, injuries. So this is clearly an escalation um, in, in terms of strategies. It's sort of going beyond the game that we've modeled into, uh, you know, a more escalatory strategy, and that you know, is obviously something that uh, we would have to think about. So on the one hand, the more obvious things 
we can anticipate, we can build up a more robust approach to uh, machine learning and so forth. And this must be done in order to deal with these uh, uh, immediate responses. And, uh, but it's a, it's a very interesting question as to what might be the reaction of the adversary beyond the obvious things that we can anticipate and deal with. Good. So another question he has in the M Mitra example for the mother child context, it appears that the models were making predictions regarding who will drop out based on how frequently they were responding to automated phone chat box. Uh, so um, let me just see, I probably lost the question. So, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah. Uh, in yeah, the uh, observation is correct. It is looking at past uh, behavior in terms of which phone calls are being listened to. Also, I, I should mention, we do use some demographic information in that case in terms of, you know, is it your first child, second child, uh, things of that nature in order to uh, improve the accuracy of our predictions. So yeah, this is uh, the observation is correct. Good. So I have one question. So let's say you're having this uh, game strategy or the learning methods and all, right? Now, assuming that everything will work in a foolproof manner, but what about if the lesser ranges are compromised? That somebody tries to, right? So in that case, the, so that means that's a, more like a security or adversary yeah. attack type of questions, right? No, this so, is the, this, this is excellent. So we have done some of this. So for example, what you're pointing out is, you know, the ranger, some, somebody is an insider threat in the sense that they will call the poachers and say, you know, today we are patrolling this area in the North. The South right. is totally free, go and attack it. Nobody's there, something like that. So uh, that's a very much more uh, difficult question. Uh, we don't have a very good answer. One thing we have tried to do is to add extra randomization in the game theoretic strategy to try to you know make make sure that uh, you know you you um, can't easily figure out what is going to happen so these are things whereby um, essentially you can try and make sure that your you know strategy is more and you know like highly randomized or something like that but it's a very interesting issue it's certainly a very relevant issue in some of the contexts that we work in where you know, there may be corruption or other things that may be going on. And uh, that's right. So there could be national adversaries working, right? And investing a lot to, and, uh, to compromise. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a excellent, excellent uh, point. And then how to, how to handle it uh, becomes a very interesting question. And some of this may have a technical answer uh, in, in terms of, you know, what can we do within our algorithms to extra randomize it, to, to add more security, et cetera, et cetera. And some of it may be beyond where uh, really the answer is, you know, some kind of uh, policy change at a much higher level. But it's a very important question and uh, we haven't addressed it. In, in particular, you know, sometimes we do AI for security, but here it is like security for AI, right? So how to take the... Yes, right. So, because your security or learning algorithm itself is not secure. So where uh, in our, uh, you know, in uh, our UAI paper in 2020, we looked at what if the poachers, I mean, they're not there yet, but what if the poachers sort of figure out that, uh, you know, there's a machine learning algorithm at work and they try to fool the machine learning algorithm by changing That's their right. traps. Or, so that we have uh, started to address uh, to some extent. But uh, once, you know, once you derive a policy and you say, okay, this is going to be your patrolling strategy today. Uh, and the rangers deliberately leak uh, that strategy to the poachers and things like that. Then of course we <laughs> run into more trouble. Um, but, but, but these you know, are good these research are... questions, right? As you I mentioned. I agree, I agree, yeah. I agree. Yeah, this is. So maybe we'll take one more question. Sainath, you have one more question because um... I think uh, Professor yes, uh, Tambe is speaking for quite a lot now. So, uh, yes. Sign up. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Tambe. So, I have a question. Uh, what would be the case when we don't have uh, the entire information about all the choices in the strategy space? So, uh, so in the game, you mean we? Uh, yes. So, <clears throat> uh, 
information about the, I, I assume about the adversary was if we are playing the game, we know what we are capable of. And so we know our own strategy, right? So uh, it's really like uh, what I'm imagining you're asking is, uh, we don't know what nature is capable of, for example, right? That's, is that, is that kind of a good understanding of the question? Uh, yes, and also what if the uh, adversaries uh, uh, choices in the strategy space are unknown to us so he might have uh, he might have uh, many different other strategies also right yeah i mean again uh, very interesting question i guess um, you know you can you can certainly imagine uh, being robust to some um, you know lack of information about the adversary previously we had talked about bounded rationality so we could imagine that we don't know the uh, parameters of the bounded rationality model very well. Uh, there may be uncertainty as to, you know, what the adversary finds attractive. Um, and so we don't have full knowledge of that uh, space. And so we can be robust to that. So we can say, okay, uh, you know, that we, we, we don't have exact information about uh, the adversary's level of being attracted to different targets. But, uh, you know, it, it is within a certain range and be robust to those sorts of behaviors. But if there are completely new uh, strategies that you have absolutely no idea about, then that certainly, you know, becomes very difficult to deal from within the game, right? Um, so, you know, you are assuming that they are going to bring, uh, uh, you know, traps or snares to try to kill animals, but they come with guns. Um, then it's, now it's a, you know, if you don't know about it, it's hard to anticipate what to do about it. So th that's clearly a very interesting and open question. We haven't dealt with that. Um, but uh, it would be more like online, online learning, right? And online games, because you just learn as you go and then try to figure out the best possible actions. Right. No, I, I, that's a very interesting thing. We haven't done it, but a very interesting question to think about. Are there other questions? Uh, so Melan, you'll be glad to know that at a steady state during your presentation, we had 60 plus audience all the time. Thank uh, you. Six, as large as 66 and more. And even during the question answer session, 20 minutes after the hour, you still have 40 plus and steady state was 45 plus. So, awesome. so your, your, your talk has created a lot of interest in the topic as well as all the exciting projects that you are uh, having. I'm, I'm very grateful uh, to the whole audience for having listened to me and, uh, you know, just very exciting to hear all the questions. Uh, very, very interesting conversation. Thank you so much for inviting me.